Okay, I sing, I sing of the glories of God. And this morning, one of the gifts that we have in this temple is our beloved pastor, Reverend John Scott, who is going to, ah, I know, just going to just wow us this morning with one or two, but mm, we still continue on this journey. Reverend John, Reverend John, let me invite you now to the podium to enrich our lives. Good morning, worldwide spiritual family. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. I've never thought of myself as a gift, but I love the <laughs> idea. Give me away. Give me all away. Just take all of me, all that I have, all that I am, are yours, a few. So take it. You know, my friends, the world is in a panic. Should I say again? This time over the effects of the pandemic on the, on the economics of countries big and small. And when people are in a panic, they tend to act irrationally and often selfishly, thinking of their own well-being and their own welfare and their own survival. And so we have, we have stories of so-called developing countries who have stockpiled vaccines far beyond what they need to supply their populations with, while other countries who, who need vaccines uh, go without and thousands of people needlessly lose their lives. Here in Jamaica, dependent as we are on the importation of much of life's necessities, we are witnessing the cost of living skyrocketing as well. And it's gone to new heights. There are people who are out of work and other people are in a panic too because they're wondering how they will make ends meet. But you know, worry about inflation and the high cost of living is not a 21st century phenomenon. Over two and a half millennia ago, the prophet Haggai in Haggai chapter 1, verse 6, wrote, and I quote, He who earns wages, earns wages to put them into a bag with holes. Unquote. In the Bible. All the way back then. And I know that many people today are thinking, boy, I feel like my, my finances are in a bag with holes. And the caretaker in my complex uh, here in Jamaica where I live, who is my kind of guru and my sounding board for the underground feelings of people, said to me, you know, General, in January, $10,000 would have full two shopping bags. We can carry one in each hand and go home. Last week ago, and $10,000 only fill one bag. He feels like his money, as Haggai said, has been put into a bag with holes. And so from every, on every hand, from every quarter, we are being bombarded with stories of lack, limitation, and scarcity. So my friends, it is really time for those of us in truth to use the powerful tools we have at our disposal and to start affirming God's unlimited abundance. So I've titled today's encouragement, You Are God's Unlimited Creation. The responsive reading, the inspirational reading that Reverend Ann shared this morning had the quotation, I am the free expression of an unlimited creator. And she had us say that together. Can we say that? I am the free expression of an unlimited creator. So if you feel like your finances are in a bag with holes, I want to just remind you of the invitation Sandra Cooper made in her Thriving Ministry update a while ago. And it is our 12-week prosperity adventure which is scheduled to begin in January 2022. It will give you the spiritual tools 
for attaining and sustaining financial freedom. And this is not a get-rich-quick course, my friends. It is a spiritual exercise designed to teach you how to achieve a sense of spiritual well-being. Spiritual well-being, which, by the way, is the original meaning of the word wealth. To be wealthy is to have a sense of spiritual well-being. And while we are on the meaning of words, did you know that the word prosperity comes from a Latin word which means to go forward with hope? So as we come out of this, and hopefully we're coming out, of this special time in the history of, of humankind, there is a need for us as purveyors of truth to use our consciousness to carry us forward and everybody with whom we come into contact with hope. With hope and with the certain assurance that prosperity really is an attitude toward life. You know, when you think of prosperity, you think of money. But really, it is, it is a, if you take a, a, a holistic picture of your life, you get, begin to see where there are holes not just in the bag that you put your money, but holes in your consciousness, holes in your belief system that need to be stopped up. Because, you know, I was writing this talk and I could hear that little voice in my head saying, you think money grow up on tree? Well, how many of us carry that? You know, you wanted a new dolly when you were a little girl. And where am I to get it from? Said your caregiver, your mom. And it, was, it wasn't done with any malice. It was done to try and give us an understanding of the value of things. I gave you one last year for Christmas and before, uh, right now you don't have no head and it's missing one arm and one foot. <laughs> you don't carry your things. So there you go again, another, another message being imprinted in your six-year-old subconscious. I'm not worthy, I don't care things. And when I want more, where am, where, where am I to get it from? Where, where you think, you think money grow up on trees? I got a beating because I said yes. <laughs> because I heard my aunt selling her avocado pears. I think it was a shilling at, at the time <laughs> um, per pear. How much for an avocado nowadays? <laughs> so the universe is expanding. Eric Butterworth, who authored a book titled Spiritual Economics, which I wish our financial pundits would read and digest, um, had this to say about prosperity, and I quote, the starting point in realizing prosperity is to accept responsibility for your own thoughts, thus taking charge of your life. You are not responsible for what is said in the Wall Street Journal or what comes out of Washington in the form of economic indicators. But you are very much responsible for what you think about those things. You cannot afford to let the so-called experts decide how you are going to think and feel. For how you think and feel about the economy in general and your financial affairs in particular will unvaryingly determine what you experience. End of quote. And then Butterworth quotes Jesus the Christ. It is done unto you as you believe. You know, in his book, this, this thing called You, Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching, writes, and I quote, when Jesus said it is done unto you as you believe, he not only announced the law of, of faith, he explained how it works. For he implied that there is a law which operates upon your faith. And Butterworth explains that spiritual law works just like any other law. It is universal. Holmes says, it's Holmes, I'm sorry, not Butterworth. Holmes says that when you, you think about law and the way it works, take the law of gravitation, he gives us an example. The law of gravitation works. You don't have anything to do with the law of gravitation, except that when you put something in, a, in, in one spot, the law of gravitation holds it there. 
you ladies that like to move things around the house. So you leave home this, your husband leave home this morning and the, the bed is in this part of the room and he comes home this evening and the bed is way across in the other side and turn the other way. The law of gravitation has held the bed in place. I hope it holds the husband in place too. But so Holmes says that that law works for you on the scale of your own individual being. The law works for you on the scale of your own individual being. So it is for this reason, my friends, that we need to refrain from referring to the economy as declining and to avoid conversations about the high cost of living. Instead, we should form the habit of thinking and speaking and contemplating the abundance of God's good that is everywhere equally evenly present throughout the universe. God is my instant, constant, and abundant supply. Can we say that? God is my instant, constant, and abundant supply. So uh, Butterworth suggests that we take frequent consciousness boosters. I call them God pauses throughout the day. And just stop and affirm your oneness with the universal substance, which is forever flowing. Uh, Here's another one he gave. I establish myself in the limitless substance of God, and I have abundance. I establish myself in the limitless substance of God, and I have abundance. Can we say that? I establish myself in the limitless substance of God, and I have abundance. And this morning, as I was doing my morning spiritual practice, this one came to me. I am a man of substance. So you can say that you can say I'm a woman of substance, or if you are gender fluid and, and prefer to use um, you know, the non-binary, you could say I am a person of spiritual substance. Can we say it together, whichever we, we feel moved to? I am a man of spiritual substance. Oh, I'm a man of substance. You know, when we talk about somebody being a person of substance, what do we mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Reverend Michael says, this way too, substance this way, but I am talking about <laughs> substantial consciousness of the good things of life. My friends, everything that is, is created from this undifferentiated substance. And our beliefs form the molds into which the universe pours this substance to produce everything in our world, both our experiences and our finances. My favorite story about how this substance works and how it flows for us or not is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. And I think you all may know this story very well. It's about a distressed widow who has been left destitute by the death of her husband. And she's in a, in a big problem because under Talmudic law, her creditors have to be paid, and if they are not, she has to give her two beloved sons to work as slaves for the creditors until the last farthing is paid. Can you imagine a Jamaican widow saying to Elisha the prophet, Do help me, do. My husband dead and leave me with a whole heap of debt, and I'm going to take me two picnic. Do help me, what me must do. And Elisha asked her a very interesting question. He said, oh, why are you having at the house? What do you have in the house? You know what she replied? I only have one pot of oil. Or if she's a Jamaica, I only have a pot of oil, you know. I only own one pot of oil may have. Lord have mercy, what me must do? I, point, I coined the phrase a few Sundays, a few encouragements ago, ungle, ungleness. I ungle have this and I ungle have that and him ungle give me two pair and him three full a pair. We, some of us have cultivated the consciousness of ungleness. But you see, that response indicates her sense of not having, 
her consciousness of lack. And friends, the pot of oil was evidence of God's substance. And I, you know, in, my, in my mind, when I think of that story, I think of those big Spanish jars that we have, big earthenware jars, full of olive oil. So that was evidence of God's substance. But if you have a deep-seated belief in lack and limitation and insufficiency, because money don't grow on trees and you have carried that from your six years old, even what you have becomes a symbol of lack to you. And that is what the work we need to do to change our belief in lack and limitation to a belief in God's abundance. Can we see what we have as evidence of God's good in our lives? So Elisha advised the widow to borrow additional vessels from the neighbors, and she did. And as she began to pour, what happened? The oil flowed freely, filling every pot. And I'm smiling because it's either my bad typing or because the computer thinks it knows more than me. But when I typed, as she began to pour, the computer wrote, as she began to pout. <laughs> you know, how many of us, even when we make up our mind to bless what we have, look at somebody else and pout. Oh, how she have so much, look how hard me work. You know, a lot of us got that kind of hole punched into our consciousness too, you know, that anybody who has anything worthwhile must have got it by, by some kind of devious means. You know, so if you see a young girl driving a BMW, mm -hmm, she have a sugar daddy. You, uh, it doesn't occur to you that she may have toiled night and day at law school to, be, to get her degree or at medical school to get her, her M M BBS? No? You think the only way you can, you can acquire a BMW and live the good life is by trading your favors. Yeah, there you go. So. And I saw it go. And I thank you now. I think so, my friends. We need to cultivate this law in our lives. The law of God's abundance. And when her idea of the possibilities expanded, because she put all these pots, these containers into which the universe could pour its substance, the oil flowed. This is a wonderful lesson on the ability of the universe to supply all that we are able to conceive, my friends. As much as you have the consciousness to receive. In her inspiring presentation on our Lifeline program last Thursday evening, Temple of Light member Sanita Moren Burris, who we have the pleasure of having her and her husband with us this morning. Welcome, Sanita and Johnny. In her presentation on Lifeline, Sonita shared many, many examples of how guided by Reverend Elmer Lumsden and in the years following this teaching known as the science of mind and spirit enabled her to provide the vessels into which the universe could pour the oil of her desires, her dreams, her wishes, her aspirations to make her the success that she is. And if you haven't, if you haven't, if you didn't see it last Thursday evening, watch it, watch the recording on YouTube and on, on, and on Facebook. And I'm saying this because uh, when Sandra was sharing uh, the, her invitation to the 12 week prosperity program, and when I mentioned it, many of you may be thinking, you know, I'd really like to do that but where am I to get the 50% down payment from? And so I wanted to share with you a big lesson I learned from Reverend Emma Lumsden, our founder as well. And when, when Sonita was talking last Thursday, I thought about it. Somebody asked Reverend Elmo where we were going to get the money from to pay for the 300 beautiful shares she had purchased for our sanctuary. And she said, where am I to get it from there? from wherever it is in the universe. <laughs> Where are you to get what you want, my friends? You are to get it from wherever it is in the universe. 
And it is there. So in her book, Lessons in Truth, New Thought Luminary, Emily Cady, puts it this way. Quote, one of the unerring truths of the universe is that there is already provided a lavish abundance for every human need. Another truth is the demand must be made before the supply can come forth to fill it. The demand must be made before the supply can come forth to fill it. I think of Jesus' beautiful Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verse 7, when he says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. And my friends, that asking that Jesus spoke about wasn't being on your knees, uh, begging and beseeching and pleading with the universe to give you what you don't have. Because you see, if you do that, the message you are giving to the universe is that you don't have it. And the universe, the law that we're talking about, obeys you perfectly. It says, you think you don't have it? You don't have it. So when we ask, that asking means making a claim upon what already exists. Because you have a deep belief that as a son or daughter, as a creation of this unlimited creator, you have a divine right to have all the good that you can envision and that you, can, you could possibly want, enough to share and to spare and to make your life what Jesus the Master called the life more abundant. And just like the law of gravitation, it doesn't care where you were born, what your background is, what your gender is, how old you are. It doesn't care about anything. The law works for everyone the same way. So I'm going to share something with you which may be an elephant in the room. It's something we don't talk about very much, but it's a surefire technique that will powerfully, permanently, and perpetually ensure that you are in the flow of divine substance. And the secret that I'm going to give you, it's an open secret. It's not a secret at all. It's a powerful truth. It is the spiritual practice of tithing. Now, tithing means giving a tenth of your earnings to where you are spiritually fed, to the person or place which nourishes your spiritual growth and your spiritual aspirations for a closer walk with God. And a lot has been written for or against it. Some people don't like the, the term and prefer to call it my contribution. The universe doesn't really care what you call it. The universe doesn't speak any one language. Um, but I want to tell you the honest truth. Nobody knows how or why it works. They don't know. It's an ancient practice that goes all the way back to biblical times. And what I do know is that in my 18 years as a minister, I have never met anyone who is a consistent tither who has a problem with cash flow and money. And I use the word consistent advisedly because I, in my own experience, and I, I can tell you I'm, at this, I'm preaching to myself here, if you give sporadically, if you give sometimes and then months and months pass and you don't give nothing and then one morning your head take you and you give a huge amount, the universe responds to you in exactly the same way. You give sporadically, you will find that your finances come to you, the inflow of, of, of money substance to you comes just as sometimeishly, as we say in Jamaica, just as sporadically. So it's the consistency of giving that is so important to establish in the law. And it's true of everything, you know. It, you see, tithing is a, is a, a, it's a choice you make to do a practice, just like you choose to go to the gym or you choose to fast. I've recently taken up the, 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 the habit of fasting, what they call intermittent fasting. I don't eat after 3 p.m. Uh, till breakfast next morning. It's a choice. It's a discipline. 
a physical discipline and for me a spiritual exercise that has resulted in my weight balancing out. Um, so tithing is the same thing. It's, it's not something you have to do. It is a contract you make with yourself to acknowledge God as the source of your life and your being and your well-being. Friends, the spiritual approach to economics and indeed to every other facet of human existence is the solution to the issues that humanity is facing. Begin today to see yourself as a distributing center of God's good. And I talk about the distributing center because a lot of times when we, we are trying to plug the hole into which we put our earnings, we are looking to get. But the law of prosperity, the law of wealth, meaning the law of well-being, is the law of circulation. Just like you can't breathe in and hold it. And your blood must circulate. So start to think about your prosperity as God's good, God's infinite substance in circulation. And so it's not just coming to you, it is flowing through you in a ceaseless and endless circulation that blesses everyone with whom your money substance that you have passed out into the universe comes. And so I think about that even too if I'm paying utility bills. Wow, I'm so happy to be able to do this because it's paying somebody's school fees. It's buying some kid's tablet um, so that they can do online learning. I just think about myself as being a, a conduit for God's good to bless the world. You know, throughout history, the spiritually enlightened have likened prosperity to righteousness. You can think of that as right useness. But you see, the admonition in Matthew 6, 33, to seek first the kingdom of, of God and his right useness, his righteousness, means that you should cultivate the right use of the divine law, which is a law of circulation in your business and your personal dealings. It is a call for us all to stand firmly on the prosperity principle that right where we are, waiting for us to provide it, to provide the containers for our good, is the substance of God, the living Spirit Almighty. And you know, my friends, those containers are not just containers purses and bank accounts. Those containers are the love that we share, the tithes that we give, the sense of community that we build, build when we get together in spiritual sangha on a Saturday morning, spiritual community, either on a Sunday morning, either here in the temple or online. Those are all containers into which the universe pours the undifferentiated substance of the Almighty to create greater and greater good in our lives. Haggai's response to the problem of the economy in Haggai chapter 1 verse 8 was to, and I quote, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, unquote. Metaphysically, Going up to the hills means seeking the silence within. And of course, houses, when you read it anywhere in, in spiritual literature, and particularly in the Bible, refer to your consciousness. So go within into the sanctuary of your own being and build in your consciousness the deep, deep belief that you are a distributing center of God's good. That house, the house of your consciousness, needs to be maintained just as you maintain your own physical home. You know, you, you don't leave it for weeks and weeks without dusting or, or cleaning or, or tidying. You keep your, your physical house in order. And that is true of your, the house of your consciousness as well. Uh, in conclusion, Practitioner Steve Golding shared a quotation from Ernest Holmes' book, This Thing Called Life, which was published in 1943. And since that is the year I was born, I want to, sh to share it with you. It's titled, 
the pearl of great price. Please listen with your heart. Holmes uses for his epigraph a line from Henry David Thoreau, quote, let nothing stand between you and the light. Let nothing stand between you and the light. And then he writes, the power of life within you is a spiritual power able to bring to you permanent peace, increased happiness and joy, and greater material abundance. These things that have made man miserable and unhappy, or those things that have made man miserable and unhappy, can be eliminated through the consciousness, the conscious use of this power. God could not visit fear or hate or impoverishment upon us because God must be just the opposite to all those things. It is then really necessary that the world should have a new concept of God. A new idea must be born in the minds of men about the nature of God and their relationship to the divine creative spirit. Holmes continues that if you know, knew the creative energy of the universe were at your disposal, and the same power which made everything is flowing through you, would you not naturally feel that you possessed the pearl of great price? If you knew how to use this power, would you not feel that you were on the verge of a new experience, wonderful and limitless in its possibility? Would you not have a new hope and enthusiasm about living? End of quote. My friends, you are God's unlimited creation. If this resonates with you, please affirm, I am God's unlimited creation. Can you say that? I am God's unlimited creation. This I affirm and this I believe. This I affirm and this I believe. My friends, you are indeed God, God's unlimited creation. I love you. Namaste. As I said, Reverend John would wow you this morning with spiritual principles. Ah, I have so many notes, but anyway, mm. I'll summarize. Prosperity is an attitude. And with the use of the powerful spiritual tools, you can build a consciousness of unlimited wealth. And as you go forward with a certain assurance you are established in the limitless supply of substance. You become a distributor circulating God's good. And therefore, you are immersed in God's unlimited abundance. And you can declare to the world, I am God's unlimited creation. This I affirm, this I believe, and thus I live. Amen. Right? Amen. So... <laughs> Thank you, Reverend John, for that. 